just one moment. Almost there. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the setting up takes just a few seconds, so we are good now. Um, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So we are uh, super excited tonight and uh, with amazing lineup of speakers and all the conversations we are going to have tonight. Um, I would formally uh, now invite Dr. Call to open the webinar. And when we say amazing lineup of, of speakers, and it means um, they are amazing speakers. So here you go. Over to you, Dr. Call. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, on behalf of the Institute, uh, Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute, I welcome everyone for this webinar to commemorate and honor Dr. Michael Hutton from University of Alberta, Canada, who recently received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Uh, this event has, be, has given us an opportunity to celebrate, congratulate, and honor him on his groundbreaking research, and also listening to his opinion on controlling of HCV infection COVID-19 and whatever comes next. I hope nothing comes next, but uh, let's be prepared for that. Uh, I'm extremely pleased that we could gather scholars of eminence for this panel, which includes Professor Bill Flanagan, president of University of Alberta, and the other two eminent medical scholars who are heading India's best medical institutes, uh, Dr. Indeep Guleria, director of India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi, and Dr. S.K. Sareen, director Institute of Liver and Biology Sciences, Delhi. On behalf of the Institute, I welcome you, sir, and wish, you, uh, wish to thank you for being available despite a very short notice, which speaks for your, uh, I would say, humbleness and also for your dedication for any such purposes or cause. I also welcome our own president, Professor Minnie Thomas, and Vice President, Professor, uh, Professor John Kershaw. Uh, and also, it is important to acknowledge the presence of some important personalities. I know that. Uh, uh, Ms. Dudery Kent, uh, who is acting High Commission, High Commissioner of Canada to India, is uh, with us uh, right now. So welcome, uh, Ms. Kent, uh, uh, for this uh, talk that you have spared some time with us. Uh, not the least, a very warm welcome to the audience and attendees for joining us uh, tonight for this talk. I'm sure you will be happy by the end of the webinar, listening to the views and uh, opinion of uh, the Nobel Laureate. Uh, we saw a fantastic turnout and participation with, in terms of registration, which has gone over 750, the la last number that we saw. I'm not sure how many are joining now, but uh, we were happy, really, really happy to see that uh, turn up. Uh, I now request our president, Professor Thomas, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Thomas, to set the agenda for today's webinar. Uh, Professor Thomas, please. Good morning and good evening to everyone present from India and Canada. Um, Dr. Michael Houghton, Nobel Laureate of 2020 in Physiology or Medicine. Uh, Dr. Bill Flanagan, President and Vice Chancellor, University of Alberta. Our distinguished panelists, Dr. Randeep Guleria and Dr. S.K. Sarin. Dr. John Kershaw, Vice President of SIKI, Dr. Prachi, Director, and all other colleagues and researchers from across India and Canada, very warm welcome to this event. Let me begin by congratulating Dr. Horton for being conferred the Nobel Prize for Physiology Medicine in 2020. At the same time, I wish to thank you, Doctor, for agreeing to talk to us. Thank you so much. And today is a red letter day in the history of Sikhi in its 52 years. When a Nobel laureate is speaking to us very soon after he has been nominated by the Academy for the discovery of hepatitis C virus. We look forward to your insights on the topic of discussion today because it's 
very, very relevant. Thank you so much for agreeing and a warm welcome to, the, to, the, to our midst today. I wish to welcome Dr. Randeep Guleria, Director of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Uh, Professor, your reassuring advices and insights on national television and print media have been so helpful to each one of us. I also welcome Dr. S.K. Sareen, Director, Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences to this webinar. Um, I wish to express my thanks to Dr. Sen Huang, Vice Provost and Associate Vice President International of University of Alberta and the team for enabling us um, host this webinar. Um, I'm so grateful to University of Alberta and the team from there. And um, today's, uh, before I welcome Dr. Bill, the president, who is the 14th president, vice chancellor of the University of Alberta. Um, I don't have to tell you the importance of today's webinar. We have been going through this pandemic for almost a year and where things have come to a standstill in across the world. And uh, it, it is um, reassuring that um, now we have vaccines, news of vaccines coming in and then, you know, life may return to normal after a few months, but it's better to listen to experts and be careful. So um, I wish to congratulate the um, SIKI director, Dr. Prachi, and the team for uh, organizing this webinar. And uh, before I conclude, um, let me welcome um, Dr. Bill Flanagan, who is the president and vice chancellor. Um, with his, I was reading through his biodata with his background in law, Professor Flanagan's work in support of HIV AIDS research and initiatives has made him a well-recognized and respected figure. And he currently serves as the chair of the Canadian Foundation for AIDS Research National Working Group. So uh, it's a pleasure, Dr. Flanagan, that uh, you have been able to join us in spite of your busy schedule. I once again welcome all the participants of this webinar. And uh, my I hope uh, the discussions will be very enlightening to all of us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Thomas. It's a real pleasure to be here today. And I want to thank Dr. Prachi Kaul and her colleagues at the Shastri Institute for organizing this event and for their leadership in building Canada-India relations over the past 50 years. And as you know, the University of Alberta is a proud member of the Shastri Institute. And we're also very proud of the many close relationships we hold in India. Our long-standing partner with the Indian Institute of Science and many Indian institutes of technology our partnerships with government and industry, and numerous joint research projects, faculty and student exchanges, joint PhD pro programs, and other relationships that help to connect India with the University of Alberta and with Canada. And today those connections, as we all know, are more important than ever. As we all are facing the great challenges, uh, or as we are all facing numerous great global challenges, and they require us to work together on shared solutions. And at this time, no example is more top of mind, of course, than COVID-19. Around the globe, we're all responding to the devastating social and economic impacts of the pandemic. And our collective drive for virology knowledge has likely never been greater than today. And at the University of Alberta, we're enormously fortunate to house one of the world's leading virologists, Dr. Michael Houghton, and recent Nobel laureate. It's my great pleasure to introduce him today. And we've been having many celebrations over the past uh, several weeks here at the University of Alberta in honor of Dr. Houghton. Dr. Houghton is recognized as an international leader in viral hepatitis research. Before being named the Nobel laureate, he had already received numerous international prizes for his work, including the Laser Clinic Me uh, Medical Research Award and the Robert Koch Medal. He held the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Virology from 2010 to 2017 and currently serves as a professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology, as well as director of the Li Kaixing Applied Virology Institute at the University of Alberta. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Nobel Laureate, Dr. Michael Houghton. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, President Flanagan. And uh, thank you to Shastri uh, for organizing this event. It's, uh, I'm really pleased to participate. And uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, I was raised in England, which means I'm a cricket fan. And I was watching India play Australia last night on the TV. And uh, I was pleased to see this morning that the score, the India got a quite a good score. So I wish you well at beating the Australians who <laughs> on a cricket field are our arch enemies in England. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you again for the invitation and the congratulations. Um, I need to share my slides. So let me sort that out. Um, I need um, the host, uh, Dr. Prashi, to share. Uh, yes, Dr. Hutton. Yes, I have enabled it. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to address uh, two pandemics today and probably uh, future pandemics, almost certainly, um, in discussing hepatitis C virus and COVID-19 infections. Uh, first, let me deal with hepatitis C virus. Um, so the award I received recently from the Nobel was work that I performed in the United States, actually, at a biotechnology company called Chiron. And uh, I worked with many colleagues internally as well as externally for seven years, um, after which we did discover the genome of hepatitis C virus, which is the major cause of bloodborne non-A, non-B hepatitis. Um, there are two major bloodborne hepatitis viruses, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Um, there's not much evidence for anything else that's causing bloodborne hepatitis, although there are some hepatitis viruses, for example, hepatitis E, that is transmitted uh, fecal orally uh, that can also cause viral hepatitis, and, and of course, hepatitis A that can do the same thing. Anyway, um, I started work uh, in California in this company, Chiron, in 1982. And we had, um, of course, plenty of patients that we could get blood samples and liver biopsies from. Um, and also several groups around the world were able to transmit non-A, non-B hepatitis, as it was then known. Uh, it, this was hepatitis transmitted after transfusion that was not associated with hepatitis A or hepatitis B markers, hence the, hence the name non-A, non-B. Um, so we had biological samples available, but uh, the molecular biology toolbox at that time was quite small. Um, PCR had not yet been discovered, polymerase chain reaction, and that's an enormous asset when you're doing this kind of work to take 100 molecules of the genome and amplify it to 100 billion, where you have real large materials available. That was not discovered. There was no antigen discovered for non-A, non-B hepatitis, as in the case of hepatitis B, where Dr. Bruce Blumberg identified a specific antigen called the Australia antigen, which turned out to be the surface antigen of the hepatitis B virus. And that was the breakthrough for hepatitis B no antibodies had been defined for non-A, non-B hepatitis, no cell culture system. And with HIV, that was the breakthrough at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, where uh, Montagne and colleagues were able to culture PBMCs from AIDS patients and see the growth of a retrovirus and view it in the electron microscope and saw the destruction of CD4 positive T cells. Um, Neither did we have uh, high throughput sequencing. So partly I tell people this is the introduction. Um, in the 80s, it took us seven years to identify the virus. If we were doing it today, as in the case of the COVID virus isolation and identification, it probably would take seven weeks. So it's a testament to how our technologies are evolving uh, exponentially. So to cut a long story short, um, the way that my colleagues and I identified 
the virus was schematically shown on this slide. Um, we took uh, chimpanzee plasma uh, from infected animals. Uh, this was provided to us by Dr. Bradley at the Centers for Disease Control. And then we ultra centrifuged such that the smallest known virus would be pelleted at the bottom of the tube. We didn't know what kind of virus this was, whether it was an RNA virus or a DNA virus. So we extracted both types of nucleic acid we converted the RNA into complementary DNA using reverse transcriptase, and then we cloned all the resulting DNA into a uh, bacteria using a Lambda GT11 uh, bacteriophage vector. This had been developed by Dr. Young and Davis at Stanford, uh, who went on to identify the T cell receptor using those methods. And uh, it's a very efficient cloning vector in bacteria, but also it actually expresses the cloned nucleic acid into protein. And so what you end up with is a very large proteomics library. Each bacteria contains a nucleic acid from the original pellet, and that nucleic acid is being expressed into protein. So you have millions of clones expressing individual proteins, and then my colleagues, uh, Dr. Chu and Dr. Kuo and myself, we incubated these large libraries with serum from patients diagnosed with non-A, non-B hepatitis. Although antibodies have not been identified to the virus at this stage, we made the assumption that they were there. Um, and it was a, a risk. Everything we did was a risk because non-A, non-B generally is a very persistent virus. Only around 20% of people will eradicate spontaneously. The other 80% become persistently infected for life unless they're, unless they're treated with antivirals. Uh, so, and that could have meant that the immune response was very weak. Um, but anyway, we took the gamble that there were antibodies. We incubated those serum antibodies with proteomics library we get typically in that kind of cloning exercise, you get several false positives, which turn out to be genomic clones from the host genome, the human and the chimpanzee genome. But fortunately, after a lot of effort and uh, in only one library out of around a dozen, we managed to find this clone called 511 by my colleague, Dr. Chu. And uh, it's only a small clone, 100 base pairs. Um, but we were able to prove that that was derived from the hepatitis C virus genome. And the way we proved it, first of all, we showed it was not a human gene or a chimpanzee gene using Southern blots. Then we showed that it was derived from an RNA molecule present only in infectious samples, not in control samples, both chimpanzees and uh, humans. And then when we express 511 into its encoded protein, we saw antibodies only in non-A, non-B hepatitis patients uh, and non-A, non-B infected chimpanzees. And moreover, we saw seroconversion to the 511 protein in animals that Dr. Bradley infected with non-A, non-B hepatitis, but we did not see seroconversion when uh, in animals that he infected with hepatitis A or hepatitis B. So um, we, uh, this is how we identified the hep C virus. And uh, as I mentioned, it was a, very much a team effort. Uh, this was taken 20 years uh, when uh, I received the Lasker Award from the United States and there was an editorial published at the same time. And this is my colleague, Dr. Quilim Chu and Dr. Kuo. Uh, both of those gentlemen worked with me at Chiron, the company, uh, for many years to crack this problem. And then Dr. Bradley was at the Centers for Disease Control, and he was an expert in chimpanzee transmission, and he provided us with a continuous supply of good samples. So, um, I think the four of us were responsible for this discovery. And uh, essentially the identification and isolation of the genome in bacterial clones really started the hepatitis C field 
now we could actually get to grips with the virus. And uh, what this slide shows is the collection of proteins that is encoded by the virus. Um, so it's a positive stranded RNA virus, very distantly related to Flavy viruses. So it's classified within the Flavy viridae family, but really it's a unique virus with only very limited sequence identity with Flavies. Um, but it's a positive stranded RNA virus that encodes a large polyprotein precursor, which is then cleaved through a number of proteases, either host proteases, for example, signalase in the ER, in the plasmid reticulum, or cleaved by two viral encoded proteases. And um, the first um, objective after our discovery was to protect the blood supply, because at that time, <clears throat> if you had um, a blood transfusion, uh, typically from multiple blood donors, um, there was a around a 5% chance that you would contract non-A, non-B hepatitis. So, you know, a very high risk, one in 20 of getting uh, non-A, non-B just from a blood transfusion. So we wanted to develop um, an antibody diagnostic that could detect the virus antibodies in, in blood donors and, th and thereby exclude them from uh, um, using their don uh, donations. And uh, it turns out 511 clone was derived from non-structural protein 4A. And uh, its function to the virus is actually to serve as a cofactor for the protease encoded in NS3. It's a chymotrypsin-like serine protease that 4A augments. Um, but it happens to contain a very immunodominant B-cell epitope. And that's why we picked it up in our cDNA screening exercise. But as we walked the genome and identified more proteins uh, going this way and more proteins going this way, we could identify additional B-cell epitopes. And so working with commercial partners, um, Ortho Diagnostics, and then Abbott, and then Roche, and uh, Sanofi Pasteur, <clears throat> we were able to spin out uh, commercial blood tests uh, that were very effective at detecting hepatitis C. In addition, uh, we established that the phi prime untranslated region of the genome is an um, internal ribosome entry site it has a very complex secondary and tertiary structure that ribosomes recognize and bind to and start translating the polyprotein. This region is very highly conserved amongst all the different hepatitis C strains around the world. So it's an ideal candidate for PCR uh, nucleic acid testing, as well as um, T7 mediated amplification nucleic acid tests. So, Eventually, you know, within a few years, we developed um, both antibody diagnostics and nucleic acid tests that when they were rolled out into the blood banks had an immediate impact on preventing post-transfusion hepatitis C. This is a, an old slide from uh, Centers for Disease Control. It's showing the incidence of acute hepatitis C. And when we introduced our first test, which was around 1990, uh, we saw a drop in incidence. The second test, once again, showed a big drop in incidence. I think um, the tests out there right now are probably series five, the fifth tests, uh, both antibody tests and nucleic acid tests. And now there is not a, to my knowledge, there's not a single instance reported of post-transfusion hepatitis C. So that was an immediate translation of our discovery that instead of uh, several hundred people around the world getting infected every day from transfusion, uh, tainted transfusions, um, we completely eliminated that with our blood tests, as well as providing important diagnostics to clinicians managing non A, non B hepatitis patients. Um, the other thing that the genome identification enabled. It took a long time, but um, we published in 1989 our results showing that we had identified hep C. And then in 2015, so 26 years later, it took much longer than what I was hoping. 
But these are publications from Jordan Feld, who's a Canadian hepatologist in Toronto, and Graham Foster, who I believe is a hepatologist in Australia. They published uh, phase three clinical trial data using a drug combination from Gilead, uh, which contains Savosbuvir, which is an inhibitor of the RNA polymerase of hepatitis C, and Velpatosphere, which is a inhibitor of NS5A, non-structural protein 5A. Um, Savosbuvir was developed by several people, including Michael Sophia, and Velpatosphere is um, the most active antiviral ever developed for any virus. And the foundations for that work were really uh, performed by scientists at Bristol Myers Squibb. But Gilead um, developed their own version of this NS5A inhibitor and called it Velpatosphere, combined it with Savosbuvir. And what you can see, irrespective of the genotype of HCV, after 12 weeks of therapy, virtually everyone is cured. The virus is eradicated. Um, not quite 100% with genotype 3, but 95% uh, is still good going. And so as of 2015, with the tremendous work done by Gilead and John McCutchinson, who led that group, um, we had for the first time specific antivirals that can cure patients. Many companies have their own cocktails. And so if rarely a patient fails to respond to this cocktail, they can be put onto other cocktails from other companies, which also include protease inhibitors of the serine protease. Um, HCV is a pandemic like COVID. Uh, a pandemic is an infectious disease that infects people all around the world, as opposed to one region or one country. That is a serious pandemic, as is obviously COVID. Um, the WHO estimates there are around 400,000 um, in, um, infected <coughs> excuse me, 400,000 infected people. No, no, excuse me, I'm blanking on this. WHO estimates there are two to three million new infections around the globe of hepatitis C every year. And so, as in the case of COVID, um, we do need to prevent uh, this using a vaccine approach. So we desperately need a vaccine to hepatitis C and COVID. COVID has killed so far um, one and a half million people around the globe, a, a, a terrible tragedy. Um, hepatitis C uh, is responsible for 400,000 deaths per year, according to the WHO around the world. So Hep C fortunately is not as terrible as COVID, but it's still a, a, a real substantial pandemic. To get a vaccine, we've been working on expressing the envelope glycoproteins of HCV in mammalian cells, um, Chinese hamster ovary cell lines. There are two uh, envelope glycoproteins encoded by the virus. We express them together. They form a heterodimer. And uh, we've tested this vaccine when I was in the United States um, in the chimpanzee model. And to this day, it remains the only vaccine candidate shown to be protective in the immunocompetent chimpanzee model. And uh, this is just a picture. This is E2 envelope glycoprotein, E1. The reason why they are very um, uh, broad banded on a gel electrophoresis like this is that they're highly glycosylated and they're variably glycosylated. Um, so the virus, as, as in the case of HIV, uses a glycan shield to try to protect itself from antibodies. And HCV does the same thing. And this um, highly glycosylated envelope protein mixture um, effects um, some protection from antibodies. We tested um, this recombinant E1, E2 vaccine in chimps. And uh, I think 
we challenged them with 1A virus, both homologous 1A genotype as well as heterologous 1A. 1A is the most common genotype in Canada and the USA. And uh, to cut to the rub, um, you can see that of a total of 31 animals that we immunized, only five became chronic carriers of the virus, 16% whereas of 24 controls that were not immunized, 63% became persistent carriers. And with the vaccine, we want to prevent persistence. Acute hepatitis C is not usually a clinical problem. It's only after several years of infection that a patient will develop liver cirrhosis, um, chronic hepatitis, of course, and that can develop into end-stage liver disease as well as hepatocellular carcinoma. So, this is the only vaccine so far that has been shown to be protective. So we're quite excited about this. Um, and uh, HCV is very heterogeneous. Um, genotype 1B is the most common, and it, it's, it's, I believe, the most common genotype in India, um, but it is the most common genotype around the world, followed by 1A and then 2A and 3A. But there are other divergent isol uh, isolates in Egypt, genotype four, in South Africa, genotype five, and in Vietnam and surrounding countries, genotype six. HCV is actually more heterogeneous than HIV. It's more mutable, and we have more variation in the hepatitis C genus than HIV. Um, and we all know that how heterogeneous that is. So the key question is, um, do neutralizing antibodies against one strain protect against all the various strains of virus? And we sent four of our chimpanzee anti serous immunized with E1, E2 to the NIH, Bob Purcell's lab. And so what they showed is that they could neutralize, the groups of four animals are being tested. They showed that they could neutralize the inf infectivity of 1A virus very well genotype four, genotype five, and genotype six. So that was very good news that a single strain can elicit cross neutralizing antibodies. Genotypes two and three are not so well neutralized, but there is significant cross neutralizing activity even with them. And at the University of Alberta in 2013, John Law in my group showed that indeed in uh, humans vaccinated with E1, E2, we were able to see broadly cross neutralizing antibodies. For example, individual number five, the different colors reflect the seven different genotypes, including seven, genotype seven here. And you can see that we had evidence for neutralization of all the strains around the world. But once again, genotypes two and three um, were not as well neutralized as the other genotypes. But for a as a vaccinologist confronting a highly variable virus, this was really a breakthrough, I would say, that a single strain can elicit such cross-neutralizing antibodies. Um, so the development status of our hep C vaccine, so at University of Alberta, we have improved the original vaccine that I developed in the United States. We are currently manufacturing that under good manufacturing process, GMP, which is required for testing in humans. We're currently manufacturing it. We hope to assemble it all together next spring or summer. Um, and then we have a number of partners around the world waiting to test it in their clinics. Um, the USA NIH is very enthusiastic to test it. The Helmholtz in Germany, uh, University of Pisa in Italy, and also University of New South Wales in Australia. So. Um, I think it has a, a very good chance of showing at least partial efficacy. We're hoping to see at least 60-70% efficacy with this vaccine. Um, now, turning to COVID, um, I think uh, the terrible tragedy that it's been um, has also been accompanied by some technology revolutions. Um, and I'm referring to uh, the new techniques for developing vaccines. Um, these are techniques that have never before been used uh, for an approved human vaccine because they're, 
they're very recent developments. One is the adenoviral vector approach to express the spike protein of COVID and uh, Oxford University have pioneered this approach. They actually developed it to develop a vaccine against malaria, uh, Adrian Hill. But then he and his colleague, Sarah Gilbert at the Jenner Institute applied it to COVID. And as most of you know, uh, they have phase three data indicating efficacy somewhere between 60 to 90%. Um, so that's very good news. Um, the really new technology that's emerged with COVID has been the RNA vaccine technology from companies like Moderna and BioNTech, who have large corporate partners and who have done a really good job, Pfizer and Lonza. And uh, the RNA vaccines, uh, I remember 20 years ago, um, it was shown by immunologists that RNA was taken up very efficiently by antigen presenting cells, dendritic cells, and were very good at eliciting immune responses. I think the problem has been one of stability. The reason why um, it took 20 years to see RNA vaccinology as a real method, uh, practical method, was because uh, people had to figure out a way to stabilize the RNA. But in addition, um, it turns out that if you give uh, normal ribonucleotides uh, in, in an RNA molecule, it's a very good stimulus of innate immunity, which represses translation, which represses the immune response. And so one of the tricks that uh, Moderna and BioNTech have evolved is to incorporate modified nucleosides that don't activate the innate immune response as well, as efficiently. And then to increase translation efficiency, the RNA is capped uh, with a five prime end cap to enhance translation efficiency. And then the RNA has been stabilized by using a complex collection of lipids, including an ionic lipid um, to actually stabilize the RNA from nuclease activity in the body. But also, it also presents the RNA as a viral-like particle. It's about 140 nanometers in the form of the lipo RNA particle. And to the immune system, that looks like a virus and therefore is efficiently taken up by antigen-presenting cells. So these are the tricks that were used in the last 20 years to develop RNA vaccinology. And um, Moderna um, have developed an mRNA vaccine incorporated in lipids, which encodes the four length spike protein. And the spike protein shown on the upper left actually forms a trimer. And so it's a large oligomeric uh, macromolecule. And the spike protein of the virus interacts with the angiotensin converting enzyme two on human cells to actually enter the cell and start replicating. And the part of the spike protein that interacts with ACE2 is the receptor binding domain. And in the upper left, that's shown in green, blue, and red, each one being part of the trimer. And on the right-hand side, it's a different orientation. You can see the green, blue, and red of the ribosome binding domains. Very interestingly, and this is work from Dr. Walls uh, published earlier this year. Interestingly, only one of the spike proteins in the trimer has the receptor binding domain available. Uh, it's the one in green. It's actually pointing up, it's accessible to bind to the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme two receptor. The others are actually relatively inaccessible. They're in the so-called down uh, formation. This one is up, this one is down, this one is down. So um, that's how the spike protein is made from the RNA. And what it does, it generates a number of antibodies, different uh, antibody uh, targeting different epitopes that prevent uh, the binding of the virus to its receptor. And uh, as you know, Moderna reported 94% effectiveness um, in a follow-up of one to two months after uh, vaccinating people twice. So 94% efficacy is very good. And BioNTech have reported a similar efficacy. Uh, once again, a two-dose vaccination regimen 
And after following up for one or two months, they are seeing 94% efficacy at preventing infection, 94% effectiveness in people over the age of 65, which is very important, obviously, because elderly people um, suffer the most consequences from COVID, along with people with cofactors like diabetes and high blood pressure and uh, obesity. So the vaccine is well tolerated. Um, vaccines normally cause injection site pain, fever and headache, no matter what they're made to. And um, this one is similar. Um, in, in some ways, it's actually a good thing to get some side effects when you get vaccinated. It means your body is responding. So I personally look upon it as a good thing. Um, and uh, it was approved for human use in Canada on December 9th. And the first deliverers of the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine arrived uh, last Sunday in Canada. And people this week are being vaccinated. Um, first of all, the healthcare responders are being vaccinated in Canada. So RNA vaccines really is the good part of COVID. It's shown us that there's a new technology that can be very fast, much faster than traditional technology. Um, and RNA vaccinology, I think, has the potential to transform the vaccine industry because it can be applied to virtually every vaccine, virtually every viral vaccine, every bacterial vaccine, except the bacterial vaccines that rely on eliciting antibodies to carbohydrate, the polysaccharide capsule of various bacterial species. Um, but everything else really can be used and applied by the RNA vaccine technology. There are some important questions still out there. Uh, the 94% efficacy re refers to one to two months after vaccination. The, obviously, the critical question is what is the effic efficacy going to be at six months and 12 months after vaccination? Um, we would predict uh, which is quite normal immunologically, that antibodies elicited by the vaccine will decline over time, as will T cell responses. That's how the immune response, them, re immune response works. And so it is possible that maybe at 12 months, we might need to have booster shots um, of the COVID vaccine. I think it's quite likely that we will. Um, and so um, then that raises a safety issue. If we keep immunizing people with the RNA vaccine, is it safe? I think probably it will be, but we have to prove that. Um, and then another key question is we don't know how good the RNA vaccines are relative to traditional vaccine approaches like recombinant proteins with adjuvants. We actually don't know which is the best method at eliciting antibodies and T cell responses to the virus. And we have to find out to find out which is the best. And also there are issues of cost of goods and logistics of the cold chain that's required by, um, by the RNA vaccines. Um, I just wanted to tell you that in our institute, we decided to use the receptor binding domain as the vaccine against COVID. Uh, we're not using the whole spike protein. That's because we can express high levels of the receptor binding domain. And if you're trying to make a vaccine to deliver to the country or to the globe, you have to have very high expression um, in order to cater for the global use, obviously. Seven billion people on the planet will need at least two doses. And so we're talking 14, 20 billion doses. That's incredible amount of vaccine, unheard of. So we decided to go with the ribosome binding domain as our vaccine antigen. We express it in Cho cells, Chinese hamster ovary cell lines. We have a GMP grade clinical cell line that expresses the, R the RBD, the receptor binding domain. We've tested it in animals. These are mice that we've immunized with an adjuvant. Um, and then what we're looking at is neutralizing antibodies um, to the COVID. And you can see in our mice uh, dilutions of one in a thousand, one in 1300 of the antisera, we completely inhibit the ability of the virus to, in, to infect the cell. Um, so we're getting very high titers of neutralizing antibodies to our vaccine in mice. Um, 
This type of vaccine has also been reported recently by a Chinese group in immunity in 2020, and they've shown that their RBD vaccine is efficacious in animals. They can immunize ferrets and hamsters and challenge them with virus and see protection. So um, I think our vaccine is, is, a, is a good vaccine against COVID and uh, potentially we can manufacture this for clinical use. We have a GMP, state-of-the-art GMP lab at the University of Alberta. And um, because it's a recombinant protein combined with adjuvant, it's stable. It can be stored at four degrees centigrade. And so several countries around the world will need such a stable vaccine. Uh, many countries will not be able to have minus 80 freezer cold chains or even minus 20. So um, we would be happy to provide our technology to any country that uh, could use our um, receptor binding domain, domain vaccine to their benefit. So um, certainly we're available to um, transfer the technology and, and transfer some vaccine to anybody that needs it. Um, finally, COVID has taught us many lessons, I believe, and, and how do we learn those lessons to prevent the next pandemic? As all virologists know, periodically there are emerging viruses. In my lifetime, uh, we've seen hepatitis C, hepatitis B, HIV, uh, West Nile virus, uh, we've seen uh, HIV, terrible, terrible, terrible epidemic, pandemic. Um, and then we saw the SARS virus in 2003. That was a, a big killer. And uh, we've had pandemic influenza strains. Fortunately, recently, not one of great severity like COVID. But of course, the 1918 Spanish flu was estimated to kill 20 million people around the world. So all virologists know that the next pandemic is coming. It may be a coronavirus, it may be an influenza virus, it may be some other type of virus. What do we do to prepare ourselves? I think COVID has taught us a few things. One is, um, if we had stockpiled vaccine against the SARS outbreak in 2003, it has been shown that that vaccine would have given partial protection against COVID it would have elicited, elicited antibodies that neutralize the infectivity of COVID. That's been shown by different groups this year. And historically what's happened that when viruses emerge, uh, academia and public health and corporations develop vaccines, but in many cases, the epidemic subsides and goes away and then everyone stops down tools and doesn't make any vaccine under GMP that could be used in humans. It's because of economic issues, obviously, but I think COVID has shown us that if we had have stockpiled vaccine against the 2003 strain, it would have prevented much of the morbidity and mortality that we've seen around the world with COVID. And so in future, I think we have to stockpile vaccines against COVID-19, against future pandemic flu strains and any new coronavirus that emerges. I think also um, it's shown the world how vulnerable we humans are to viral infections. And I think governments around the world have to spend more money on basic infectious disease research as well as translational research in infectious disease. We must have more people trained and ready to respond. Um, and I think also some countries, including Canada, um, ha I think has to increase their manufacturing capability. Um, countries can't be completely dependent on other countries for vaccine uh, supplies. And I believe Canada is in the process of ramping up its manufacturing capabilities in case we have a, a future pandemic, which will happen. There's no doubt about it. It's just a question of when. And then finally, I think, um, we do need to come together as a, uh, a global forum in a, in a sensible, mature way. And we have to discuss what public health measures can we take to reduce uh, the next outbreak of a pandemic. You know, there are certain things we probably can be doing 
to reduce the interaction of humans with um, poultry and with other animals that can carry viruses like the flu viruses and the coronaviruses. And um, there are probably public health measures we can take in all countries to try to reduce exposure to such a new virus infection. So I very much hope that in 2021, uh, global forums will be organized to discuss this in a very sensible, um, mature way. And so uh, it remains to me to thank uh, many people in my Canada Excellence Research Chair Lab, as well as in the Li Ka-Shing Applied Virology Institute. In particular, John Law is a fine virologist that's done a lot of the work on hep C and COVID. Mike Logan is a fine molecular biologist working on both viruses and Amir Landy is an excellent cellular immunologist. And I can't go through all the names, but these are all fine young people that uh, will be our leaders in the future at the U of A in our institute. And uh, Laurent Terrell is my collaborator and uh, friend and mentor. And uh, we've worked closely together on all the projects in our institute. And funding support is listed here, which is of course very important. We've had great support from the Canada Excellence Research Chair, the Li Ka Shing Foundation, the government of Alberta and other, other institutes. Thank you very much for the invitation and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. John. This was, uh, you know, we were all thinking why the clock is running so fast. And uh, uh, it was amazing. I am in no capacity to praise it, uh, the detailing that you have presented to us. Uh, even, uh, you know, people like us who are not from uh, that background can make out the nuances of the work that you have done. And that has led to this uh, wonderful prize that you have won over. Congratulations once again, sir. Uh, it was uh, quite an engaging and remarkable uh, opportunity uh, for everyone present here to hear your views and ideas. And uh, I would say that uh, the kind of sharing of your work that uh, valuable information such as new technologies innovation, and the innovations happening in this, in the terms of developing the new vaccine and future viruses that maybe in the few, maybe in the near future, uh, we will have to deal with. Uh, and of course, the measures that we can take as, a, as humans to, to avoid such a kind of pandemic to come in. Uh, I wish we had more time to, uh, to, to, for you to listen. And uh, I really hope that very soon we will, have, we will have another engagement with you so that uh, this discussion can be carried out uh, further. Uh, at this point of time, uh, I would also like to acknowledge a couple of important people who have joined us. Uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Sitapati, Dr. Shanti Johnson, Dr. Brasinha, uh, Dr. Sarvana Kumar, who was uh, at Ministry of HRD earlier, now known as Ministry of Education. Uh, there are a couple of other senior colleagues who have joined. Uh, I would not be able to name them, but uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's uh, wonderful to see you around and uh, engaging uh, towards this uh, program that Shastri has organized. Uh, it is uh, now time to have a special remarks from our panelists. Uh, may I now invite uh, Dr. Randeep Puleria, Director, All India Medical Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Uh, as uh, uh, he needs no introductions, but uh, I can just say that he is the head of the Department of Pulmonary Medicine and Sleep Disorders at uh, Indian Institute of Medical Sciences, where he has been working since last 23 years. Uh, he was the first uh, Indian to get the Doctorate of Medicine in Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine, and uh, also awarded with, uh, conferred with prestigious Padma Shri Award in 2015 by the President of India. It goes, there's no end to the credentials that goes for him. So I would uh, uh, straight away head to invite him and ask him to share his special comments and observations here. Dr. Kuleria, please. Thank you very much. And I'd like to start by uh, congratulating Dr. Michael Houghton for the Nobel Laureate Prize of 2020 in Physiology and Medicine. And I'd like to say that uh, the work that he's done is really seminal and really something which uh, for us as clinicians is really path breaking. 
And that was what really came out uh, as far as this talk was concerned, to see how technology has changed and what was done uh, in the early days as far as uh, identifying hep C was concerned, looking at developing diagnostic kits and working on uh, the vaccine uh, was uh, really um, uh, hard work at that point in time. But what really has changed is how technology has sort of uh, brought us in a fast forward mode as far as COVID-19 is concerned. And as was very nicely shown, the new platforms that we have for vaccine development, which has allowed us to get a vaccine within a year uh, for COVID-19 using both the mRNA platform and the uh, adenoviral vector platform and various other uh, uh, platforms which are now available, um, almost six or seven platforms for uh, vaccine research. So it's a very exciting time for vaccinologists. Uh, I would just say that probably in the next year, we get, we'll be spoiled for choice as far as vaccines for COVID-19 are concerned. And when we look at the vaccines, we discuss efficacy, but it's also an issue of effectiveness. It's the issue that the vaccine, which is currently available, may be good, but it should not be the enemy of the best. And we may have a vaccine which is better in the coming months. And then it's going to be a huge challenge of deciding how to really roll that out and how do we do research then? Because it would be, or some people would say this unethical then to have a placebo group where you will really not uh, give a vaccine. And therefore you will be looking at what one would say is non-inferiority -inferior trials rather than looking at a vaccine. So challenging times when we are going to have so many vaccines. Um, and then of course the whole issue of would, if you're having a decrease in immunity, would a different vaccine be uh, beneficial if it's given in sequence rather than the same vaccine being repeated uh, as far as uh, immunogenicity is concerned. So I think that's uh, interesting and uh, very fascinating in terms of the work that's being done using the uh, receptor binding domain to develop a vaccine. As was very rightly said, there has been a lot of discussion about a pandemic and how we need to be prepared for a pandemic. For us who've been involved in this for almost 20 years, I, I remember in 1998, we had this huge discussion that we will have a huge pandemic. And that was when we had an outbreak of H5N1. H5N1 is what is known as avian influenza, a bird flu. And it started off as an outbreak in South China, happened in a, a large part of Southeast Asia. And this was a virus which was causing infection in poultry workers, but it had, it had a case fatality rate of almost 60%. That means 60% of individuals who got this infection were dying. And subsequent studies done in labs in the US and in Europe showed that you needed just two, two mutations in this virus for it to really have sustained human to human spread and, and become a pandemic with such a high fertility. And that is why there was this huge concern of really working on uh, a vaccine for this. A vaccine was even developed for H5N1. And then there was this whole issue of a new pandemic Luckily, we got H1N1, which was a milder form of the influenza pandemic. But I remember attending meetings at that point in time in WHO, uh, in the scientific advisory group of experts, and there was a stockpile for H5N1, which was actually uh, made in the US and in the UK. And there was the, the discussion with industry of make, having a virtual stockpile for, for future pandemics. But as was rightly said by Dr. Houghton, the whole issue became of limited shelf life of vaccines, and therefore the, in the recurring cost, which would be there if you were to have stockpiles of vaccine. And let's say policymakers not being that much interested in investing so much in developing um, a, a vaccine or a vaccine platforms for vaccine uh, for pandemics, which may or may not happen. You can't really predict when the next pandemic will happen. And I think COVID-19 and past experiences with MERS coronavirus with Zika and so many other outbreaks that we've seen over the last 10, 15 years have really told us that we really need to invest more in research, in more in developing vaccines and having the stockpile. And I would also say a good surveillance system to really pick up any um, outbreak and being able to contain it before it becomes something which is of a global nature as uh, we saw in COVID-19. So this is a wake up call for all of us to really take outbreaks and pandemic seriously, invest in it, 
and be prepared for a future pandemic, which I'm sure is going to come. We need to just uh, accept that and work uh, both as clinicians, as epidemiologists, and as basic scientists to really be prepared for that. Thank you very much. May I uh, now invite uh, Dr. Sareen, uh, Director ILBS Delhi, to share his reflections. Before that, just a brief introduction. He is a senior professor, hepatology, and director of Indian Institute of Liver, uh, Institute of Liver and Biology Sciences, New Delhi. He was instrumental in setting up the, the institute itself uh, under the, the Delhi government uh, uh, here in Delhi. And he is also director uh, WHO Collaborative Center on Chronic Liver Diseases and Viral Hepatitis at ILBS. He is credited with several new treatment protocols for liver diseases and also been bestowed with uh, Padma Vibhushan by Government of India. Uh, Another uh, uh, wonderful award that he has received was Shanti Patnagar Award. Dr. Sareen, over to you, please. Thank you, Dr. Prachi, and it's a pleasure. And uh, listening to Dr. Michael Houghton was like knowing him. You know, humble, polite, focused, and who acknowledges all his colleagues and their contributions. He never said me and my colleagues, he said, my colleagues and me, salutations. He speaks volumes about the science, the quality and the human being. Also congratulations for bringing hepatitis C <laughs> into the knowledge of people. You know, I as a student and then subsequently working in hepatology for almost now 1981 onwards, realize what exactly it means to us, non-A, non-B, was like non-existent. And I remember reading your papers and I worked with Dr. Girish Vyas, so I remember how to work on uh, unknown viruses and it was a challenge. So your journey, very, you know, you put it so simply, people thought it was simple to discover hepatitis C, but but you have to know that those days, even PCR, what you call RT-PCR being done in 30 minutes, there was no PCR. And then you could discover and totally unconventional. I want to tell it because people do not know exactly the discovery of hepatitis C was a breakthrough because this was unconventional. Finding out from the bottom of the sea, a pin, it's like billions of, uh, you know, CDNA libraries were screened and how you could get on to 511. It could be partly luck also, but I, I must say that it brought us to the discovery of hepatitis C. And you can see that it is several times more, 170 million people are infected with hepatitis C and India has 10 million. You know, it's not a small number. And hepatitis C is supposed to be the number one cause till 2030 for liver transplant uh, all over the world. So I think it's not small. Somehow it just never got that COVID kind of attention. And uh, not that everything should get COVID kind of attention. We don't want that. But yes, the money, the attention, the prevention. And unfortunately, despite its discovery 31 years ago, the vaccine is still eluding us. Hepatitis B has a very good vaccine, but nothing to prevent, protect, or neutralize hepatitis C infection. With that little background, uh, I may ask a question or two uh, to Dr. Houghton before I give it to the moderator. One or two, suppose, I mean, we know that we have your GPE1, the envelope protein uh, vaccines, the homologous recombinant. Why is it that uh, uh, it has not worked so you know uh, widely? And if you are given all the money, all the support, will you use a different approach like an mRNA vaccine using a small portion of HCV core and use it for making more proteins? Yes, thank you, Dr. Saren. Um, great questions. I think um, 
I started the vaccine work at Chiron, this bi uh, biotech company. And uh, later on, it was bought by Novartis. And we had a plan to take the hep C vaccine into human efficacy trials in 2007. Uh, but unfortunately, I left Chiron and Novartis at that time thinking they were going to perform efficacy trials. But after I left, they decided to focus on influenza and meningitis vaccines. So it was a corporate strategic decision. If they had gone on and done the efficacy trial, I feel it's likely that they would have seen at least partial efficacy and we would have a partially effective vaccine by now. So unfortunately, corporate priorities have played a role in the lack of a vaccine for hep C. And um, that's why when I came to University of Alberta in 2010, I decided to pick up the program again. Um, but I agree with you, uh, we very much RNA technology can be used now for hep C. We are discussing collaborations with one of the uh, RNA vaccine companies and potentially it could move it much faster in the future. But as you also said, we don't yet know which is the best. Is it RNA vaccine or is it adjuvanted proteins? Um, as you know, and as you said, the hepatitis B vaccine is an adjuvanted protein vaccine, and it's one of the best vaccines ever made. And uh, remains to be seen how, how the adjuvanted protein stacks up against the RNA vaccines. We'll have to find out. Thank you. And one brief uh, uh, additional thing is uh, we have, in fact, we were in 1995 started with the RT-PCR for the first time in India for hepatitis C. It took almost six years from the government to say the testing for hepatitis C is necessary for all blood banks. Six years till the Supreme Court of India passed a law that all the people must be tested. Now, my question to you is that you also now have a huge influence on policy all over the world. I would say that, would you like to say that all blood banks, all those who got surgeries done in the past, all those who received blood transfusion in the past must necessarily get tested. And this is one of my dreams that anybody has infection but should not get a disease. So I want to humbly request you and through you many others that all those who have received blood, blood product surgery should get tested for hep C and that should be free. Why are we not making anti-HCV testing free for those? Yes, I totally agree. Um, it's very important to find and detect the carriers of hep C as you know, many people carry the virus, they're not aware of it, but if you look into their livers, they some of them have severe liver disease. So you have to treat early rather than later before liver cancer has developed. So I totally agree. Um, having a community screening in all countries is very important for hep C. The tests individually are quite cheap. Of course, with huge populations, uh, the total cost is high, but it's well worth it in terms of lives saved. And uh, in terms of treating patients with antivirals, in terms of liver transplantation costs, um, um, I think the screening, community screening will certainly be cheaper overall in the long run. Uh, and I'm happy to help out uh, with that um, program in any way. Um, in the US and Canada, um, people have been strongly advised to go and get tested for hep C for two decades now for that reason. And um, yes, I would certainly be happy to put my, my, uh, my situation behind that initiative in India. Just let me know how I can help. All right. Thank you so much. And we hope that you can be the face for this for the country. India has a national viral hepatitis control program, the largest in the world, where all hepatitis C testing is free and the drugs are free. And this was launched in 2018. But people still are scared of the stigma of hepatitis C. 
they don't come out well i won't take more time and i will pass on to dr prachi but it was a pleasure and honor to hear uh, dr hoot and and we do hope to connect with you again thank you dr saran thank you dr sareen for your observations and uh, some very valid questions that you have posed on and uh, i think it is time uh, dr hitton if you have uh, if you can let me know if we can have a couple of questions from the audience uh, yes, do you have sure. time okay yes, all right yes. so i'll just read out couple of i mean i'm sure uh, we won't be able to address all but uh, there are uh, good questions here uh, and to begin with i would like to read out a question uh, looks like uh, Uh, a scholar of shastri uh, he is a young fellow and he is asking how should anyone get could get nobel prize at young age mainly in the science domain have you ever expected for getting a nobel prize during your school days sir <laughs> no i had no expectation of that <laughs> whatsoever um my uh, my objective was just to make a contribution and to to healthcare to medical research and it didn't matter to me if it was a big contribution or a small contribution any contribution was what i wanted to make and uh you know i don't think uh people go into this expecting to win awards that we yeah. want to yeah. we want to help patients and we're interested in the biology and uh i think that's those are the important initiatives okay thank you sir uh the other question is from dr sita pathi he is uh, asking what is the effort and cost to do a technology transfer uh, as you have mentioned in your talk uh, for an emerging market like india or asia well i think um primarily we want to <clears throat> contribute to the control of covid so we don't want economics to get in the way um and so i think um we are we are happy to provide our gmp grade cell line to whoever wants it um you know we we have um we have to outsource for adjuvant uh, possibly in india you may have adjuvant experts and and have your own adjuvants so probably the first thing to do would be to test those with the protein uh we can provide some protein now and then we can also provide our gmp cell line so um you know we're happy to help um you know uh, it, probably there will be some costs at our side so if if it's possible to uh to re, uh, to pay for costs uh, but covid uh, we don't want to make profits out of covid um we want to help um so yeah thank you sir Uh, another question is uh, will these vaccines be effective towards the new mutated strains of the covid viruses yes um great question um so far we know that the vaccine is active against all strains um there was some <coughs> discussion about whether the mink virus uh, was also neutralizable um but I have not seen any data either way suggesting it is neutralized or cannot be neutralized. So I think we just have to wait until the data is available. I've tried to get hold of the mink virus mm -hmm. without success so far and um I think so far it's it's looking okay, but we just have to keep testing any new strains to find out if they are cross neutralized. Okay. Thank you sir. Uh there's another question uh with the researcher is checking on is there any inclination that protein uh, adjuvant based vaccine provide more longevity than mrna or lipid viruses a fantastic question and we don't know uh, but we have to find out so we have to compare these different vaccines see what the titer of neutralizing antibodies are what the t cell responses are quantitatively and we have to look at memory b cell and memory t cell responses none of that has been done but it needs to be done and it needs to be done quickly and i i'm assuming institutions like nih are doing that and other institutions but absolutely uh, we need to do those experiments um long term protection will be dictated by the level of memory uh, b cell and t cell responses 
And so we have to look for those with all the different vaccines. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, another question uh, 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 from Professor Johnson. Uh, she's checking on COVID is further highlighting the differences between rich and poor, the haves and haves nots and all the detriments uh, of health we know result in health inequalities. This can be said for the vaccination rates as well. Can you comment on the equitable access to vaccine within countries and across high income or low income or middle income countries? Yes. Well, um, it's one of the reasons why we're very happy to provide our cell line to anybody that wants it. Um, um, yes, I think, you know, the rich countries obviously scramble to protect their citizens first. Um, you know, uh, obviously that is a phenomenon um, that occurs, um, but also as human beings, um, uh, we, have to, we have to look out for our neighbors elsewhere. And I, I think we all want to do that. And I think the level that these vaccines can be produced at means it is capable of providing global supply. I think we have two RNA companies. We have several adeno-based companies, Oxford, AstraZeneca, J&J, &J, and we have several recombinant protein vaccine corporations. I think in a, in a few months' time, we're going to have a lot of vaccine available, and it absolutely needs to be given worldwide. Um, and I think I hope it will happen. I, I suppose it's inevitable the rich countries will, will get the vaccine first, but I hope, uh, and I think it will quickly be dispersed throughout the world. Um, I mean, uh, not only on humanitarian basis, but also on the basis of the virus, you know, a virus is infecting the human population and we know only too well it, if it's in uh, Australia, yeah. It will quickly be in India and in Canada. So from that, both humanitarian and from a biological point of view, we have to protect all humans on the planet. Sure, we, we think so, yeah. Thank you, sir. Last question probably uh, from Dr. Kundu. Uh, he's saying, vaccination has caught the global imagination. Uh, what is your take on therapeutics? Yeah, to be honest, I've been disappointed that we haven't got great new therapeutics against COVID by now. I just thought it would happen very quickly. I've been a bit disappointed how slowly antibodies have evolved. You know, we have fantastic technologies now, as you know, to make neutralizing monoclonals. And I'm surprised we have a few companies that have got those, um, Regeneron and Abcellera in Canada, but I'm surprised the big companies that have uh, explored antibodies for cancer therapy have not jumped in faster. Um, so I've been a bit disappointed. And, um, you know, I think the other issue with therapeutics for COVID, rather like influenza, that there's a window of opportunity where a therapeutic is going to be effective. And that's a very short window before disease has been initiated. So you've only got one or two weeks at the most where a therapeutic can really be effective very early on in infection. Um, but that said, it's, I, I have to say, I've been disappointed that we haven't been faster at therapeutics. Um, I'm sure that will be rectified next year, but um, the vaccine field has shown us the way rather than the therapeutic field, I would say. <laughs> sure, thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, we are done with the questions because time is running fast. Uh, may I now invite uh, uh, Dr. John Kershaw, Vice President of the Institute, to uh, present the vote of thanks. Dr. Kershaw, please. And I request uh, Dr. Kershaw to switch on his uh, video so that also we can have a good picture for our records. Oh. 
Okay, I think um, uh, Dr. Kershaw is uh, being challenged in terms of technology. His microphone is not working. Uh, may I now invite uh, Dr. Thomas uh, to uh, take over and say a few words and conclude the session? Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I wish to thank uh, Dr. Michael Houghton for uh, very inspiring and um, very interesting lecture. Uh, like Dr. Prachi said, even for um, ordinary people like us who are not, um, you know, doctors, it was very interesting how uh, things evolved over the years and what contribution um, for hepatitis C diagnosis and treatment, the contributions you have done and uh, um, the, the answer to the question whether you dreamt of becoming a Nobel laureate was <laughs> Um, very, uh, you know, very well answered that you, you wanted to serve the humanity, not to get a prize. Thank you so much, uh, sir, for your time. And uh, it was very interesting. And I'm sure we got a lot of insights. Thank you so much. Um, look forward to more interactions from you in the future. And um, uh, Dr. Guleria, thank you so much for giving us uh, your time and your insights were uh, very helpful. You talked about uh, many other uh, pandemics uh, uh, in India and in the world at large. That was also very interesting. Thank you so much for your time. And Dr. Sarin, um, uh, your, your, uh, your uh, insights as well as questions were very interesting uh, because we never realized uh, hepatitis C was um, as dangerous as this. We never realized and your um, request to Dr. Horton to, um, you know, make uh, the testing um, of uh, all the patients who had surgery or blood transfusions on hepatitis C. I'm sure uh, the government will take it up. And uh, when it comes from a Nobel laureate, uh, the request, I'm sure many countries and uh, many um, decision makers will, will follow this advice. So thank you so much for your insights and contributions. And I um, uh, thank the president of University of Alberta uh, for his time and um, all the participants um, who uh, participated from the institutions, member institutions of SIKI. We have 116 uh, top institutes in India as our members and 40 plus from Canada. Uh, including many of the U15 universities. So can, uh, thank you so much for joining today. And uh, my special thanks to the team, uh, my Siki team, Dr. Prachi and uh, Piki and everybody else for organizing this. Thank you so much. Have a good day to all in Canada and uh, good night to everybody from India. Dr. Sen, um, Sen thank you so much for your uh, involvement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a good day and have a good night, please. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now. Bye for now. Thanks, Dr. Galeria. Thanks, Dr. Saran, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Prachi, Dr. Sen. Thank you, sir. And good luck in the cricket. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And Thank Merry you, Christmas to all and a happy new year and safe new year 2021. And to you all. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.